are going to uh, see. Uh, so we are going to talk about population synthesis, uh, like in more details. I already mentioned population synthesis uh, many, many different times so far. So now we are going to look at how uh, how these uh, simulations work in, in more details. Um, and we will use, um, um, so we will see also an example of input and output of these simulations, um, specifically on black holes from population three stars. So we will also introduce these new kind of stars, um, new, I mean, at least uh, during these lectures. Um, and this is going to be an excuse to introduce next, next generation detectors. So uh, yes, the telescope and, 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 and so on. So definition of population synthesis. So uh, population synthesis is the place where we um, implement the physics uh, that drive the isolated formation channel. Uh, for example, the mass transfer, common envelope, things that we already discussed. The place where we implement this physics is population synthesis simulations. Uh, these are fast codes uh, that can evolve hundreds of millions of binaries um, in few few hours. Uh, and the way we, we can do that is because uh, stellar evolution is pre-computed, either with fitting formulas or with stellar tracks. I'm going to, to show you an example of these stellar tracks. Um, and binary stellar processes are, um, uh, are implemented with analytic or semi-analytic methods. For example, the alpha-lambda formalism for the common envelope. So in a nutshell, no hydrodynamics. So this is uh, what allows us to evolve quickly these uh, millions of binary systems. There are several codes around, uh, several population synthesis codes. Uh, the one that was developed uh, in Padova uh, is called SEVEN, uh, which stands for Stellar Evolution and Body. Um, SEVEN um, is, um, um, is particularly interesting because uh, what it uses is pre-computed stellar tracks. So it doesn't use fit fitting formulas. Uh, the difference is going to be clear in a second. But basically, uh, what we can do in seven is that we can, um, uh, for example, update stellar evolution models. For example, let's uh, let's think. So let's um, we want to, for example, follow um, um, the evolution of rotating stars. We can evolve our stellar tracks uh, in codes, for example, as Parsec, and we can use those stellar tracks in seven. So this allows us basically to explore another piece of the parameter space. Uh, on the single stellar evolution. <laughs> and we are going to see an example by using population three stars. Um, seven is written in C++. Uh, um, recently, a wrapper of seven, seven pi, has been, uh, has been developed. Uh, and I think it really boosts the usability of seven uh, in, the, in, the, in its application, because you can really use seven from, from Python, like for a Jupyter notebook. Uh, we do not have time to see uh, how to use 7Pi, but if you're curious, I really uh, encourage you to go to this uh, user guide, which is super well written, um, and you can start you know, crunching your code and use 7 directly from Python. This is very cool. So uh, population synthesis codes uh, is basically, uh, so th this scheme basically represents a population synthesis code. So you have uh, an engine that follows the single stellar evolution. So what you need to include are the properties of single stars, for example, the mass and the radius, um, the metallicity. Um, and, and so you need to, to define these this, uh, initial properties. Um, why? Why I'm so unlucky? <sighs> I shouldn't have chip out. I bought the yeah, exit. Okay, go back. So, and then you need to uh, the, the the single stellar evolution engine uh, follows the single stellar evolution processes. For example, supernova explosion, supernova kicks, uh, but also you know um, radius evolution, whatever concerned the single stellar evolution. And the other engine follows uh, binary follows basically binary processes. So what you need to define are uh, the properties of the binary system, semi-major axis, eccentricity, so the, the initial properties of your binary systems. 
<clears throat> and you need to define the processes of that uh, are you know typical of the binary evolution, for example, the common envelope, lo Rochelle low over overflow. So a population synthesis simulation is basically a place where you combine these two worlds, single and binary evolution. Uh, so in, when you want to launch a seven uh, run, you need to define inputs. For example, you need to define the properties uh, of the population of massive stars. Again, the mass, mass ratio, distribution, orbital period, um, and uh, metallicity. And the known parameters governing the single binary evolution, for example, the common envelope efficiency. So what you need to do is to set uh, this uh, initial configuration file. So let's see an example, uh, and let's, uh, let's see how we can use seven to model black holes from population three stars. So population three stars uh, are believed to be the first generation of star ever formed at high redshift. So we are talking about the first star formation of these kind of stars at redshift um, uh, above 20. They are massive uh, and formed from pristine gas. So in the case of population three stars, uh, we put metallicity equal to zero. And you can start already thinking what can happen to these black holes if you put metallicity zero. Uh, they are still undetected. However, there are traces of their existence, which WST, James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I'm, I'm putting there some references you can follow if you are curious about these traces. However, we do not have like a statistics. Like we do not have, uh, for example, the initial properties. We do not know uh, the mass uh, distribution of population three stars. We don't, we don't know this. So we need to model them. And we need to model them through cosmological simulations. And I'm going to talk about that uh, extensively. So seven uh, allows you to use stellar tracks. So what we can what we can do is to evolve uh, stellar tracks of population three stars and inject them into seven. Uh, this is a work that was extensively done um, uh, by a colleague of mine, Guglielmo Costa. So in this plot here, you see on the uh, on your left the stellar track of population three stars, and on your right uh, the stellar track of metal poor but still population two stars. Uh, so, what you can see from these stellar tracks is that uh, pop star three pop star can are more compact and hotter than population two stars, and you can realize that in this part of the of the HR diagram. So you can compare this. So this is just to tell that uh, based on stellar tracks, you already have a difference uh, between the evolution of single stars between pop three and pop two stars. Remember that you can always interrupt me for questions. Uh, sorry, can you? This number? At uh, this one, uh, this is the initial mass of the main sequence. Sorry. Um, okay. Yep. Do you mean by stellar wind? Yeah, of course. Uh, this is what I was referring to. In, in population three stellar, uh, in population three stars, stellar winds are quenched because you do not have metallicity. Now we are going to talk about that. All right. This is the plot you were looking for. Um, so this is a plot that um, compares initial mass functions. Um, we talked about the initial mass function many times during these lectures. Um, so this is like the um, uh, distribution, the probability distribution of initial mass in the zero H main sequence of stars. So uh, for population uh, one and two stars, the initial mass 
mask that is uh, used is the, this model here, crow one KRO1, this model here, the dashed, the dashed dotted line, which is this one here. So this model is the one that is usually used for, for metal rich star, like, uh, like our sun. And this is also connected with the fact that we expect that the mass spectrum of black holes is a, pow is a, is a power law. This, the idea comes from the fact that the initial mass is, come, is a power law. The other models, for example, log one here, which is like a, a flattening log, uh, a uniform log mass distribution, this model here. This is our fiducial model for the initial uh, mass of population three stars. So I told you we do not have like statistics. So the, the way we, we expect population three stars are more massive with respect to pop one and two stars is because we can run simulations, for example, of cloud gas and see where the, um, the, the basically the gas plunges down and form the, the first seed of star formation. The other model, uh, LAR1 and TOP1, are other simulations that, of course, take into account um, other assumption and provide you uh, with uh, with different initial mass function. For example, the the, the 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 most extreme one is the top one model, this one, which is a top heavy initial mass function where you expect to have like the majority of stars in the in the high mass part. So what we do is in seven we take the stellar tracks that just just showed you before, and this is like a fixed parameters. And what we what we change are uh, the initial conditions of the binary system. So how, for example, we sample the initial mass in, in the zero H mean sequence. Yes? You might have to set it up uh, and we do not go like beyond, like 1,000? Let me think. Uh, I really don't remember if it was like a technical issue, because um, uh, because you, you you need so the the mass that you sample from the mass function must be uh, you know tracked by the stellar trucks and the top like the, the maximum stellar trucks is 600 solar masses. Um, I don't know if it's a technical issue that basically or. I need to look. Uh, need to look carefully on it, but it's, uh, it's a pretty good question. Um, so we wanted to explore uh, the parameter space of initial conditions. So I, I just described you the, the various initial mass functions that we took in account, but also we explored uh, the orbital period uh, again with two different distribution, uh, the mass ratio between the two masses in the zero edge main sequence, the two stars in the zero edge main sequence, and the eccentricity. Again, this, um, um, so for example, the, just to give you a reference, this uh, model here, log one, is the one that we use in population one and two stars. Uh, same for the eccentricity. This is what we use for population one and two stars. So the idea was to uh, let's compare uh, initial um, properties of metal-rich stars to what cosmological, to what simulation predict for population three stars. This is the general idea. Okay, so um, you you crunch your your initial condition, you run seven, you get outputs, uh, and this is what you can get. Um, so the various colors uh, are models of black holes from population three stars. Uh, and here I'm plotting the primary mass distribution of the black hole. Um, the gray histogram is black holes from population one and two stars. And you can already see that this histogram here uh, has a maximum between eight and 10 solar masses. And this, uh, and the black holes from pop three stars has a maximum between uh, 35 and 40 solar masses. Can you say why? You. Uh, 
This is exactly the explanation. So we do not, so population three stars has, so yes, yes, I'm going to do that. So um, population three stars uh, have uh, zero stellar winds. They do not lose mass due to stellar winds because they have like a zero metallicity. So like in massive star can retain the total mass they, they started with, and this is going to end up in the final black hole. So this is why uh, you have these two completely different mass spectrums of black holes. Yeah, but from the star to the black hole after the explosion, you lose 60% uh, of the mass, 80%, 20%. Sure, sure. Then, then you need to factor. You need to factor in all the binary evolution. For example, you you see that the mass spectrum mass spectrum plunges down at 50 solar masses. This is the effect of the pair instability supernova. So uh, I'm. Of course, you need to take in account also th of those effects. This is why you do not have like uh, you do not cover the completely the mass spectrum of of black holes from pot three stars because you still have binary evolution. This is kind of hard to see from this plot which models do not predict any high mass uh, object. Can you can you say so something more? It's hard to see. I mean, you can immediately say that some of these models do not predict any of the higher mass ones, right? But this is uh, something that we like, actually. Uh, we see that as a prediction of our, like a strong prediction of our models. Because as we change, as we change the initial conditions, so these are initial conditions, um, masses, mass ratio, orbital, period eccentricity, we kind of find uh, quite the same mass distribution. So this is something that we like. However, we have uncertainties in the rates. Now you all know very well Cosmorate. So um, you already seen this equation. Um, this factor here uh, is, 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 is what, so it's is, is evaluated with output from seven. So by using the catalogs of black holes coming from seven. Uh, now we need to discuss more deeply this, this, this factor here, the star formation rate density. So as you remember, you can factor the star formation rate density. Uh, you can factor out the metallicity in the star formation rate density. But in the case of, of POP3 star, this is a delta function. Because uh, this is, of course, an approximation that we did. But we assume that all POP3 stars uh, form with zero metallicity. Um, then you cannot put like zero in your stellar track evolution models. So you, you, we put like the, the lowest possible number, which is 10 to the minus 11. So basically, the factor here of metallicity cancels down. So we need to take into account the star formation rate. But again, as I, as I told you, we do not have direct observation of pop three stars, and we need to rely on cosmological simulation to model the star formation rate. So let's see this. Cos the, let's see this cosmological simulation. Um, so in this plot, you see the star formation rate as a function of redshift. Um, the dashed line is the um, star formation rate from population one and two stars, um, exactly the Madao and Fragus model that is implemented by default in Cosmorate, the one that you used uh, the other day. And all the other models are star formation rate from uh, for population three stars. Um, <coughs> of course, you see different models because uh, we took in account different uh, simulations that take in account different assumptions. <coughs> But you can see like a general trend. Uh, for example, the peak of the star formation uh, of pop three stars goes from redshift eight, which is this, mod this green model here, to redshift 20, which is this model here. Uh, and it is lower of magnitude, is it is order of magnitude lower than the star formation rate of pop one and two stars. So, um, so by looking at this, um, you can already see that the, the rates coming from pop three black holes tend to be like uh, order of magnitude lower. Um, and this is exactly what we got. So this is the merger rate density of different models. The colors are the same as before. So here we are looking at different initial conditions. And we fix the model of the star formation rate density with the model H22. So the little uh, gray box that I'm putting here um, is what actually LIGO Virgo Kagra is now observing. So the width of the box 
is the Redshift bridge. I was pretty generous because I put like the maximum limit of Redshift 2, but still. Um, and the height of the, of the, of the box is the 90% um, uh, credible interval uh, predicted by the LIGO view collaboration. So what, what can we see, what can we, so what are the conclusions by looking at this plot? Can you say it? So we can say two things. First one, black holes from population three stars do not explain the rates observed by LIGO Virgo. Pretty obvious. You do not expect like to have like huge rates of pop three stars in the local universe. Um, we do have a peak of the merger rate density for certain models, um, but we are not going to observe it because they are too high redshift. This is the conclusion that we get from this plot. So are we able to detect these binary black holes mergers? Text generation gravitational wave detector. So this, so in the following, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the future. Do you have questions about black holes from pop three stars? Uh, either everything too clear or too difficult, probably. So the first detector I want to talk about is the Einstein telescope. Um, three facts about the Einstein telescope. First, it's going to be like an underground infrastructure. Um, there are several shapes of the detector, but the most, um, so the one that is um, usually sold. You know, please, please let Lyle, please let Lyle know. Thank you, thank you, it's all right. Um, it's all right. So an, an underground infrastructure uh, with a shape of a triangle with 10 kilometers uh, side. So like a huge detector. Current detectors uh, have a, um, a length size of uh, four kilometers for LIGO, or three kilometers for Virgo. So here we are uh, looking at like an uh, uh, enormous infrastructure built underground. Um, also, the, the suspension systems are going to be uh, like huge. We are talking about um, suspension system of 30 meters. So we are, so we are looking at like a, an, um, a ginormous infrastructure. Um, there are two candidate sites uh, nowadays. Um, we need to, I mean, uh, the, the still, still decide where to build the detectors. But one site is in Sardinia, in Italy, and the other site is in. Uh, this region here, which is um, between the, 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 the very final part of Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany. Um, so the technology uh, is pretty wild. So basically, the detector, uh, if, we, uh, if the, the triangular shape is going to be built, uh, the detector is made up three interferometers, so the, 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 the red one, the green one, and the blue one. Um, but actually, what you're looking at it is a, uh, of a total of six interferometers, because the, the Einstein telescope we will build uh, with um, the so-called xylophone um, design. Basically, you will have an independent detector uh, that looks at low frequencies, so basically, um, we have like lower, lower, um, lower power of the of the laser and like cryogenic temperatures, and the high frequency detector so with much higher power and basically room temperature detector. So uh, the idea is to um, to have for each of the three detectors, two detectors, one looking low frequency and one looking high frequencies. If you combine everything together, what you get is this um, power spectral density distribution. The, the red line uh, is the, um, the official um, noise uh, budget that uh, you, you, peop, like the collaboration use uh, to, um, to make prediction of the Einstein telescope. And it is the sum of the low uh, frequency detector and the high frequency detector. Um, Cosmic Explorer is uh, basically the equivalent, but built in the US. Um, is, is, it won't be built underground, but um, they are going to match, uh, they are going to have similar uh, performances because they are going to 
build uh, like longer arms of the detectors. We are talking about 40 kilometers, so even bigger than the Einstein telescope, uh, but without the underground technology. Uh, we can compare the predicted sensitivities. Um, so we have uh, in blue like uh, Virgo uh, and, and in red like LIGO and Kagura, and, and Kagura in, in, in orange. These are the sensitivities uh, of current gravitational wave detectors. <coughs> Uh, I want you to, co to, to look at the sensitivity of the Einstein telescope compared to, 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 to those uh, currently operating. And you see that the wall is, is moved at like way lower frequencies, almost fre 2 hertz, where you have like, the wall where you can't see anything beyond that. So you are actually gaining a, 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 like a huge uh, portion of the frequency band that actually allows you to, uh, to see more sources and more distant sources. Um, questions? Yeah. Mm. I think the reason must be look at the fact the Cosmic Explorer is not built underground. So I think you can go to, to lower frequency than 10 hertz. Yeah, seismic vibration are mostly superficial, but it makes a huge lot of difference if you go down 50 meters or 500 meters. Mm. So this plot is the more optimistic uh, depth. I mean, then it depends on the amount of money, how, how deep they will sure. go. Sure, sure. I mean, this and is a curiosity about Cosmic Explorer. It will be superficial, but you cannot be straight and superficial for 40 kilometers. Yeah. So it will be a trench. So part of it will be just underground, just to be straight over the surface of the Earth. So you will be in the underground? Yeah, it's not really underground, like a trench. So as a further demonstration that the Earth is round and not flat. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't understand why the, uh, the Newtonian uh, background will be, uh, be fewer in the underground. Can you explain me that? Uh, the, the reason is uh, what Ricardo was uh, referring but to. But uh, he was talking about seismic. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. basically you, you, you quench the, the noise source if you go underground. But New Newtonian are also uh, taking account kind of uh, gravitational uh, variations and stuff like that, right? Uh, variation or gravitational wave field, yes. Yeah, so when underground, we will, uh, we will, I don't know, decrease this, this signal, this noise. But you're talking about the gravitational wave signal. Yeah, I mean, just the noise. I, I don't because I have a plot here of, uh, I, I was reading a, a paper about this, and I have this plot about Newtonian, and Newtonian also uh, decreases when you go under the ground, right? No, Newtonian noise basically, you know, gravity field is a wave part and the longitudinal part of Newtonian. <laughs> and you, you see, for it, clouds, clouds that are moving, they don't produce gravitational wave at, <laughs> at the appreciable level, but they produce a gravitational varying field. That stays, of course, going underground doesn't shield for that. So this Newtonian noise due to moving stuff stays, of course. You cannot shield gravity. But the fact that you shield the seismic um, vibration, like uh, Filippo was saying two days ago, you know, the, um, uh, the sea hit the seashore, and this produced wave that propagates for thousands of kilometers away from the seashore. And so those are shielded if you go a few hundred meters underground. Other questions? Feel free. So another way to um, look at uh, different sensitivities, like in, like in a way I think we understand better, is by looking at the Rashid horizon. So basically this plot um, uh, traces the maximum redshift at which you can detect sources uh, as function of the total source frame mass, um, in this case of a binary system. Um, so if you look, for example, at, at a LIGO, uh, you see that uh, this is advanced LIGO. So you see that the, 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 the rest horizon is still pretty high because it's a one, two, three, four, five, if I'm wrong, um, for 
100 solar masses in total. So it, uh, at this type of plots are also done with um, mass ratio equal to one. So 50 solar mass and 50 solar masses of a black hole, you can see it up to redshift five with like LEGO A+. Uh, story is different if you use uh, third generation detectors like Cosmic Explorer Einstein Telescope, the purple and, and green line, you get a redshift up to 100. So um, another way to see this is this with this plot. So um, this represents the evolution of our universe um, with second generation detectors, so current gravitational wave detectors, you, uh, you get to up to redshift two. Uh, this is GW190521 uh, that uh, was at redshift 0 0.8, the maximum redshift hit by a source so far. Uh, I mean, it's a big chunk of our universe. Uh, we're looking at uh, almost 10 billion years of evolution of our universe. It's still good. Uh, but if you want to push uh, the limits and see, for example, pop three black holes, uh, you need the Einstein telescope. Um, because going up to Rashi 100, uh, you are looking at way beyond the ionization epoch, so the, the, the epoch at which uh, pop three stars uh, initially formed. Um, so, how we detect POP3 black holes, how we, because um, um, we, we, we can make calculations, uh, like precise calculation on each single of our source. Um, so, if you remember this likelihood, uh, it was uh, the beginning of lecture two. Um, I, I, I promised that I was uh, talking about this factor here, which is the, um, uh, the selection effect factor in lecture four, so now we are. There. Um, so this uh, factor here is uh, basically this integral. So it's an integral on all the parameter space. So it means an integral over all masses, all luminosity distances, uh, all, sky all sky localization. So all the parameters that define a gravitational wave waveform. Um, and the product of the astrophysical population. So in this case here, lambda means uh, all the various model. Uh, that we have from from seven and from Cosmore, so all our population of black holes, um, and we need to uh, multiply by this p dead. So usually this uh, quantity here is evaluated via Monte Carlo summation, where we sample from our astrophysical population, and we inject these samples into this p dead, and we do an average. So the, the square bracket is the average sum. So so now we want to evaluate. This um, this function. Um, so p dat how uh, p dat is defined uh, as one. So this is an approximation, of course. There are like more sophisticated ways to do that. So p dat uh, is defined equal to one if the SNR of a SD of the SNR of a given uh, source is above a certain threshold. Zero if the SNR is below that certain threshold. Um, the SNR uh, is evaluated uh, using the um, inner product. Um, you can relate, basically, it is like a matched filtering, but instead of having the signal coming from the detector, you have uh, just the, the signal. So it is this, basically, the, the, you, can, you can see the difference between this integral here and the one that I defined during lecture one. Um, the threshold can be, can be chose. Um, depending on what you're doing. Uh, if you want to be conservative, you can put like a high threshold. So for example, you, you ask that your uh, source has a, at least an SNR of 12, or you can be less conservative and put like an SNR of eight, but at least eight. Questions? Answers, okay. Okay, so this is the detection rate of population uh, three black holes. The detection rate is, um, uh, as uh, intuitive, intuitively is the number of sources that you expect to detect with your detector evaluated with the Einstein telescope, um, which is basically, um, basically it comes from the merger rate times the selection effects in first approximation. So here I'm showing the detection rate as function of all the initial models, the log one, log two that you already seen. And different colors are different star formation rate densities. Um, so the, the answer is yes, the Einstein telescope is going to observe these black holes, 
we are going to have between 10 and 10 to the 4 um, detected mergers per year of black holes from population 3 stars. Uh, so this, this is also a way to see how astrophysical models are connected with our detector. So the, na the detection rate depends on how many black holes from POP3 stars our universe actually produces. We don't know that, but we can model that with seven cosmos and so on. Uh, the cool thing is that uh, between 20 and 70 percent, again, depending on the chosen model, of all the mergers are happening in redshift higher than eight. Um, so we are looking at um, a redshift zone that is already in dominated by population three stars. You can expect that pop one and two stars in that redshift zone is almost quenched. Very promising result. Um, again, I want to talk about uh, Einstein telescope uh, capabilities uh, on sky localization. This is connected to what we said yesterday um, about multi-messenger. Uh, I, re I remember someone of you also asked that. So what you have here is redshift on the x-axis uh, and the number of sources within a certain sky localization on the y-axis. So the blue histogram is the, the total injected population. So here we are at low redshift. So we use black, so we use sources from um, uh, population one and two stars. Um, the green histogram is the detect all the detected sources, and the, and the other colored histograms are sources that are detected uh, within a certain sky localization. Um, for example, uh, in this plot here, you see that you have like almost 10 detections per year with a very precise sky localization, 10 degrees square. Um, of course, this depends on the design. What I'm showing you, you here is the, uh, the design of one single Einstein telescope with 10 kilometers arms. Uh, if you go to this reference, you see the exactly the same plot with other designs, if you want to, to see. Um, I also invite you to go, uh, this, is, this uh, goes to the um, GraceDB, the, Grace, uh, the, the database, the public database that I showed you in the first day to compare the, 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 the sky localization that we have with current detectors, just to see the improvement that you get with the third generation detectors. Questions? Okay, so that was uh, ground-based detectors. So let's go space and let's see what we can get. Um, the, so the first thing that you, so the, 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 the most promising, probably, uh, mission of uh, gravitational array detector in space is the LISA mission, which is going to be like an enormous um, and gigantic detector. It is depicted here. It will have like three probes uh, at, uh, at a distance 2.5 million kilometers orbiting, um, orbiting an L1. No, this is not L1. No, orbiting there. Um, <laughs> um, and it's going to orbit, at, uh, I mean, the, the, the sun at, at one astronomical unit. Um, I wanted to show you this video that explains the technology of LISA, uh, which I think is very, very interesting. Uh, I think we have time. Pathfinder will operate 1.5 million kilometers from Earth towards the Sun, orbiting a stable point called the first Sun-Earth Lagrange point, or L1. There, it will test technology for future space-based observatories to detect gravitational waves. It will do so by monitoring the motion of two cubes that will free fall in space, separated by 38 centimeters. Between them, a laser interferometer will measure the relative separation of the two cubes to unprecedented accuracy as external and internal forces disturb the spacecraft around them. Housed in two vacuum enclosures, the free-falling cubes sit at the core of the science module. On 
On top, a solar array provides power to the instrumentation and acts as a thermal shield. Several sets of micro-neutron thrusters located on the outer panels will continually apply minuscule amounts of force to move the spacecraft and keep it centered on one of the cubes. This experiment will demonstrate that it is possible to put two test masses in a nearly perfect freefall motion. This is an essential underlying condition to detect gravitational waves from space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pathfinder was in L1, Lisa Pathfinder. Uh, it was this mission to test the technology uh, of the Lisa mission. Um, so as, as the video said, they were looking at um, uh, the fact that you can actually measure uh, the position of these free-falling objects. Uh, in the Lisa mission, these objects will be, they will be put 2.5 million kilometers apart with a laser going on between the two through probe. So, and this allows you, um, so that was Lisa. Oh. Okay, the, the lunar gravitational wave antenna uh, is then um, another proposal, uh, less, ad less advanced with respect to Einstein telescope and Lisa. Um, but basically what, um, what we want to do here is to put like a gravitational wave detector on the moon. Uh, again, um, uh, taking advantage, uh, taking advantage of uh, other technology. So um, basically, the idea is to use the moon, uh, the entire moon, as a gravitational wave detector. So the moon is almost um, uh, geologically dead, so you have like very, very, very low uh, seismic signal, and we want to take advantage of this fact. Uh, we know that because during Apollo 17, they, they put like a like a gravimeter, like um like a seismometer on the surface of the moon. Uh, so the idea is to, um, uh, is to place like super hypersensitive uh, seismometers on the surface of the moon. Uh, more, pre pre more, more precisely, on, uh, in within a crater, um, like the seismometer are, you know, placed far apart to see like correlation between the, the, the the, 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 the three instruments. So why we need to build a detector on the moon? Because we want to do this, multiband observations. Uh, let me explain what you see in this plot. So here you see like uh, the, the various uh, power spectral density or strain as function of frequency. Of what we expect LISA will be, the red, the red line, uh, the Einstein telescope will be, the green line. And you see that in this zone here, um, you are basically uh, between like the mm, the high noise budget of Einstein telescope and LISA. So we are actually missing a link between these two detectors. So this is why the, the origin of building uh, a, a third detector that actually covers um, the, the, the power spectral density of LISA and of the Einstein telescope. So, Let's say that we, we turn on all our instruments, Einstein telescope, LISA, and, and, um, and the lunar gravitational wave antenna. What we can do is multiband the observation. Yes? Are you expecting to have a much narrower bandwidth, um, the lunar um, response? Because you should work as somehow a resonance. I mean, how come that is so wide, the response of the, the moon to gravitational mm. wave perturbation? I think I didn't understand your question. No, but I mean, I was thinking of the bars, no? The old bars. The bars, they work at resonance, so the gravitational wave arrives, so their sensitivity is confined um, to their resonance frequency, of course. You can enlarge it a little bit. Ah, okay, so you're How think come that the moon is large? I mean, the blue line is mm. the moon, no? The moon detector. Ah, uh, so you're thinking that the moon is used as like a huge resonant bar. Say, I mean, I might be wrong, you, you correct me in case, but if... How does it reconcile with the large bandwidth? So as I, what I know about resonant bars is that they were looking at like higher frequency. So yeah, you have the, the pitch size, frequency. No? The size of the bar Depends. and the speed of sound fixes the frequency. Okay. The moon is much bigger, so you go to lower frequency. I guess if you do the math, you get the size of the moon, the speed of sound, you get around 10 to the minus one Earth. The size of the moon is 1,000 kilometers, mm. right? 
the speed of sound must be of order of, um, of 100 of meter per second, so you get at 3 minus 1. But I if my intuition is right, it might be wrong. But if it's right, no, I think it's a good intuition. But um, how come? But yeah. I don't know how to answer to, okay. to your intuition. But uh, it's something that I would like to, to look I'm at. Just puzzle that is so wide. Um, okay, maybe maybe, maybe it's the logarithmic scale that makes it wide. Okay. No, no. Other questions? Yeah, over there. Uh, the first question is, what uh, constrains the characteristic strain? I mean, why the, the strain of is, uh, is so uh, kind of uh, bigger than the other ones? Since it, it is in space. Do you mean at lower frequencies? No, yeah, the characteristic strain. L See, the characteristic strain of the laser goes uh, up here than the, the other ones. Yeah, the, the noise level is higher. Yeah, it's higher. The noise, okay, yes. Ah, you would expect like to have like the same. Uh, yeah, I mean, wh what's the constraint for that? Do you know it? Uh, what I know is that, um, so, for, so for example, in, in the case of Einstein telescope that I know better, what actually makes like this plateau uh, is the photon shot noise. I don't yes. know if it is like the same reason for Lisa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe because of distance you have a kind of more powerful laser and uh, you cannot reach the, uh, yeah, okay. Might be. And the second question is, why is the shape of the blue line like that? Like a, this, uh, like, uh, yeah, cosine, something like that. Um, so you get those shapes because um, when you, um, this is something very new actually. Um, what you are looking, so basically the moon is made up of, of layers of different materials. Uh, and I think the interaction of, uh, so th the interaction between these two, two layers are going to give you this, these bumps. It's okay. typical of a completely different technology. Mm -hmm. And what is this SMB? SMBH? And now I'm going to talk about the, oh, uh, nice. the okay. that. So the, the gray uh, lines that you see here are signals typical signals of, uh, of gravitational wave uh, sources uh, in the Fourier transform, in the Fourier domain. Uh, so the this is a supermassive black hole merger that is like uh, the, um, the reason why we're building LISA to actually look at this type of uh, sources of these type of mergers. Um, if you... This, uh, this is a signal of GW17817, GW19501914, uh, the first gravitational wave detectors, and this is a signal of, a, of an MBH. So what happens basically is that uh, as the, 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 um, the, the mass involved, the redshift shift involved, basically is going to shift your signals on, on to the left. This is something that we discussed many times so far. The, the, ob the object, so the, the, the purpose of actually looking um, the purpose of multibanded observation is exactly this, that you can see like in one detector the signal uh, and, and you can follow the signal in the other detector and then you see the emergence, for, exa for example, if I'm taking this IMBH, and you see the emergence in the Einstein telescope band. So this allows you to have like a super long, um, uh, super long detection and, and, and basically it's going to put constraints uh, on, f or for example, a waveform analysis. Xylophone? Yeah. What do you mean? Xylophone. Do you mean? Yeah, sure. <laughs> you, you can sonify all the signals and see. Um, problem is, yes. How you distinguish them? Ah, uh, this is my last paper, <laughs> if I have time. <laughs> no, this is a very good question, actually. Um, so I showed you that black holes from pop three stars ha have like larger masses, and they are the, the, the peak of the merger rate is a uh, higher redshift. So what the detector actually measures is the detector frame mass, which is exactly this quantity here, the total mass times one plus Z. So in population three 
black holes, you expect they have like a larger detector frame sort detector frame mass. So this is the, um, like a level zero um, fact that can allow you to distinguish the sources. Uh, but then, of course, there are overlap regions. Um, and the solution is the one that I presented in my last paper, for example, with machine learning. You can distinguish these two populations. So, but it's a very interesting problem. Sure. The difference with primordial. So primordial black holes, um, so the problem of primordial black holes is that they, the max spectrum varies by order of magnitudes. You can also have like, like subsolar mass black holes in the case of primordial black holes. And also the rates, the, um, the rates um, estimates covers order of magnitudes. However, black holes from population three, uh, black, uh, primordial black holes, uh, like the, the main characteristic is that the rate is increasing with redshift. While all the other rates coming from star, all the other black holes coming from stars, the rate is decreasing because you need at a certain point the star formation rate to start, while primordial black holes come from cosmic inflation and so you, the peak of the rate is basically a cosmic inflation. Um, so to answer your question, primordial black holes could be basically anywhere in these plots. Uh, but what you want to look at actually are primordial black holes very far in distance, so at Rashid above 40. At that point, you can rule out formation of stars in the Einstein telescope case, of course. Um, of course, I tricked you uh, because um, you, uh, if you do math, the, you cannot do like multi band observation for all the sources because it could last like this IMBH here, it's, it is starting here, but the time that goes from here to here may be like 10,000 years. If you do like, this is like, about, like um, a power spectral density, basically. So again, if you want to do multiband observation, you need to select uh, a number of sources that are actually, that can you, can you actually observe in the, in the three detectors. Questions? Okay, so this is the end of the first lecture. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, do population three stars uh, leave a different signature on the distribution of other black hole parameters, like aside from primary mass and distance? Like, do they have different mass ratios or spin distributions compared to other population stars? Mm. So, mm. we didn't look at, um, so, it's an open question. yeah, yeah, super open. So basically, um, it is very hard to, um, constrain the spins of, of massive stars. Again, we do not have observation of OPTI stars. We do not know if they spin or you can look at a simulation, of course. It would be, so in, in the simulation we ran, basically the spins distribution are exactly the same between the two populations. So you have aligned, very small and unlike spins. But this is biased on our simulations. Um, it is an open question, though, to, to, look at, to look at, for example, if you have like different spin distribution between the two sources. Um, mass ratio, I mean, if, if you look at mass one, mass, so we look at the, um, we also look at the mass ratio. You have a different in mass ratio. Black holes from pop three stars tend to be, tend to have like a lower mass ratio in the local universe. They tend, tend to have like... Um, more unequal. More unequal, exactly. But this is a really an open question. So can I chime in? But people usually say you know, that the spin, spin orientation is usually differs from um, dynamical formation and from... Yeah, um, yeah. In that, case, in that case, you can also take advantage of different uh, chi-effective distribution or chi-p distribution. But the, these black holes from pop three stars were formed in the isolated formation channel. 
it is also like a um, super open question to look at the formation of black holes from pop three stars in the dynamical formation of channels. It is like a very active uh, topic nowadays. Probably Alessandro is going to talk about that. Are you? Like dynamical formation channel of pop three stars? Okay, so you looked for it, huh? It's going to fill <laughs> blackboards of equation. And the relative importance of each formation channel uh, might not necessarily be the same for each population of stars. Or do ex you expect Principle, it to yeah, be the sure, same? Yeah, sure. So, mm, the main difference is metallicity. Metallicity is zero or above zero. So yes, you are looking at completely different environments, completely different um, evolution pathways. So yes, you could have uh, like a fraction of merger from the dynamical formation channel in pop one and two stars and another one in pop three. In principle, yes, we do not know that. Um, in in the beginning of the week, you were saying that we can estimate the the characteristics of the binaries that are merging. I mean, the mass and all the stuff. I mean, uh, can we understand the galaxies that the uh, this these mergers these these binaries are in? And with this, with the next generation, can we study high headshift galaxies? Using uh, gravitational waves. Mm. Ah, okay. <laughs> so just 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 to answer, uh, you need to to look at uh, this plot here. So the um, so if you want to observe the host galaxy, you need to have like a super low sky localization. Already at, at ten degrees square, you have many galaxies to, yeah. to point at. Um, the number of, um, so the sky localization um, plunges down as you go to high redshift. So you can see that the redshift 1.5 sky localization is, is poor. Um, you can improve this plot by using a network of 3G detectors, but I don't think you can go to like redshift 8 and to have like a sky localization on, on this order of magnitude. So I don't think we are going to observe um, uh, with gravitational waves, the host galaxies of pop three black holes. What we can do, we could observe the host galaxies of pop three binary neutron stars. Uh, if they produce, for example, a short GRB, we can observe GRBs at redshift seven, eight. We have them, uh, but this is again like a super new and open question mm -hmm. to study DNS from pop three. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but they, they cosmology is, is the topic of next week, or one of the courses next week. Okay, so in this uh, lecture we, we saw how population synthesis works, at least in an input-output fashion. Uh, I talked about population three stars, which is like a very open, hot topic nowadays in research. Um, and they are especially, and they are one of the main scientific goals of uh, next generation detectors. The reason why we are studying these black holes is because uh, we know we will have next generation detectors. I let you with further readings. Um, of course, if you want to look more carefully in pop synth, I suggest you to go directly to the papers where they are presented. And if you're curious on the 3G detector, uh, power spectral density, noise, I heard many questions about that. Again, uh, I'm leaving you with readings. And so this is uh, my final lecture. Um, I promised at the beginning to provide you with a toolbox uh, to provide you with the basics to understand gravitational wave astrophysics and to move your first steps. We saw how we can detect gravitational waves, uh, how we do parameter estimation. Um, we saw how compact objects form the isolated dynamical formation channel. Um, how can we can relate this with host galaxies and multi-messenger astrophysics, which is going to provide us like a bunch of new uh, information on many, many different physical processes. 
And I hope I was able to let you know how the future gravitational waves is brighter than ever with next generation detectors. Who had other questions? Okay, before we take more questions, I will leave here the sheet for tonight's dinner. So just check your name if you're coming so we know how many, how many tables we need to reserve. Questions? Uh, <laughs> uh, can you talk about the schedule for the ICE telescope and the Cosmological Explorer? Ah, um, so 2026, uh, we need to write the roadmap, which is the um, a document that lists all the requirements for the detectors, mm -hmm. and this is going to be pivotal for um, uh, select the, um, the site on which the Einstein telescope will be built. I would say first data taking, 2035? 35. 35. Oh. Mm? Have they started like taking in 2019? Like, so if it's, it's, it's usable for science, it's going to be years. 2014? So, and, also, and also the same for LIGO and Virgo. They started data taking long time ago. But until they iterate to a sensitivity that's usable, for science, uh, how long it will pass? Mm. Yeah, I see. Also because uh, the Einstein telescope has a huge um, like cryogenic system, which mm -hmm. is something. And, and what about the, the, the CE, the Cosmological Explorer? Uh, um, roughly, I would say same, 2035, 2030. Uh, however, um, between the two, Next generation detectors, I would say Einstein Telescope is more advanced in the design and project. Mm -hmm. uh, something that is going on this, this very year for Cosmic Explorer, to find mm -hmm. the money and the people. Yeah. So the good thing is that we have like the Einstein Telescope collaboration. So we have scientists uh, that are actively working in the development of the telescope, both on the instrument side, the data analysis side, and uh, science side. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Which is also a problem because they are <coughs> taking man pow man, uh, person power out of Virgo, but that's a different issue. Ah, that is a problem I don't want to get into. <laughs> uh, thank, thanks for the lectures. Um, I was wondering, uh, related to what uh, Ricardo said, um, when Einstein Telescope uh, works, I, uh, what would happen with LIGO and Virgo? Like, they would become obsolete, or maybe can be used as a cross-check? No, absolutely not. So, so, so uh, the current gravitational wave detector is essential to um, test the technology. For example, CAGRA mm -hmm. is like a, the first, uh, like an underground system, so it is essential to test the technology. But also, if you look uh, in the references uh, I gave you, um, what we can do is to, use current gravitational wave detectors to better localize systems. Because localization depends on triangulation. Of course, if the current gravitational wave detectors are not going to observe at all the system, they are not useful. But at Rashi 1, Rashi 1.5, they are still useful. Thank you. Also, if I can chime in, uh, the detection of LIGO Virgo, they still need uh, at least uh, signal to noise ratio 8 in at least one of the detectors. <coughs> but if you have the detection of ET, they can help in sky localization even if they have signal to noise ratio two or three. So even ultra weak signal that by LIGO Virgo alone will not be signal can help in sky localization if they are detecting Einstein telescope. So I mean, now we are at the level of 100 detection per year, say. So the detection with which they can help in Einstein telescope can be one order of magnitude more. So they can help in 1,000. But of course, Einstein telescope will have hundreds of thousands. But in, in 1,000 out of those, LIGO Virgo can help. No, we don't trash them. Don't worry. The problem is that to have people working on both, I mean, to have the community <laughs> large enough, to have enough personal power. So that's why we need to train new generations. Of instrument, I mean, I guess here nobody's an instrumental physicist, but at some point, 
also Latin America might contribute to instrumentation mm. science. So, yeah. Uh, so just a general question, what do you think are like uh, next steps and open questions that like this population th synthesis methodology can uh, you know, hope to answer in the following years? So how population synthesis are still useful in third generation detectors? This is your question. Uh, how, I mean, there's a, so there's a couple of years that uh, <coughs> we have like a 10 year in the window to develop it even further. So by then like, can we, we will be, will we be able to do like more stuff with this, with these simulations? I see. So, um, so this is like again another very uh, hot and open question. So because one can ask, um, <coughs> yeah, this is a genuine question. Uh, I think I personally think that this is also the right moment to um, to develop the next generation population synthesis, because um, with Einstein telescope we could I don't know infer the alpha common envelope to percent level, but this is something that we were discussing also yesterday. But how we um, combine this percent level knowledge of the alpha common envelope with uh, the actual physics of binary system. So we, I think we can ask more to the Einstein telescope with the Einstein telescope data, uh, especially for low ratio binaries where we have like a clear picture of the mass spectrum of black holes, way better estimate of spins with respect to, to what we have now. So I personally think this is the, also the right moment to inject new physics in population synthesis. But this is also a technological problem because you want population synthesis to be fast. It's like a tool, import, like essential tool to do statistics. Um, but we have new technology. Uh, we have GPUs. We have machine learning. We can speed up population synthesis. But again, this is like a super open question. We need people to, to run those code. Yeah, yeah. If, if I wasn't clear, we need peop we need to train people on the Einstein telescope era right now, uh, because when we when we when we switch on the detector, we want to be prepared. Um, instrument data data analysis of the Einstein telescope is a huge topic. We cannot analyze uh, thousands of detection per year with match filtering. It's not going to work. We need other solutions, uh, and we are talking about that, like actively talking about that and we're looking for solutions. It's a challenge. I like it. So uh, I have a comment about this second slide, about the evolutionary track slide that you put in. Uh, no, it's, I think it's the second one or the... The second? Ah. Yeah, this of the Asher entire diagram. Yeah. So probably it's so useful to put in this diagram which instruments are good for which masses? You know, have this <coughs> limit, two limits. I mean, how we talk about this limit of 1,000 solar mass? I guess the limit is from, I mean, Eddington limit and Gene's limit because pop tree, the metals, I mean, avoids to start to be formed. So that is a physical limit. But for the, the instruments that you talk about, some of them are good for form, I mean, Massive black holes, probably other ones that are good for low mass, pop two. So have you an idea how we scanning this diagram with instruments from now? Um, so but th these are stellar trucks. Uh, so you're talking about electromagnetic instruments, yeah. not gravitational waves. Yeah, in general, yeah. Uh, well, the problem is that, uh, so, so, I mean, uh, so far as I know, GWST has observed, so observed traces of pop three stars. So like clumps of gas at super low metallicity. But you're actually extracting information from those mm, poor detections so far. Um, I think it's not something that is going to constrain this, this plot. Um, you might have like magnified sources, if you are lucky. In those cases, you can observe them better and probably put constraints on them. So I, I have very little knowledge about GWST and how it can, can constrain. But those, as, so far as, I, I mean, as far as I know, constraints, um, like a promising way to put constraints is with, with gravitational waves.
my opinion. want to go further in this stuff in the future, in which instrument is good for which star, right? Because, yeah, this pop tree is a very open field, so we expected a lot of physics on that. In low mass pop star, that Vladimir say, how this form, I mean, what physics can support this low mass star in pop tree? You know, this high mass limit in 1000 is a real limit. Uh, mass loss is another problem in this stuff, so many of stuff come come this this diagram, right? So going once, I'm going twice. Okay, let's thank Philippe again. <laughs> so we.